Hey guys, and welcome to episode 3 of QFT, A Compelling Journey. In the last episode, we found that SU2 and SO3, although they had the same Lie algebra, they were actually different groups. In this episode, we will discover that the difference between these groups is one of topology rather than one of algebra. We will then see that this difference, combined with the rules of quantum mechanics, is responsible for this strange phenomena of half-integer spin. But why are we bothering to do this? It turns out that the symmetry group of special relativity contains rotations as a subgroup. In fact, most of the complications in understanding how to make a quantum Fourier Lorentz invariant will be identical to the complications of understanding rotations. We start with rotations because it's a simpler group to understand. We saw in episode 2 and 3 that the set of all symmetry transformations on the physical states of a quantum system form a group. The symmetry representation theorem tells us that for each element of the group, we have an operator representing the transformation. By restricting to connected Lie groups, as we will do for the remainder of this video, we find that the operators are all unitary. Now in episode two, we assume that these operators form a representation of the group, i.e. that the product of two operators is equal to the operator representing the combined transformation. But now consider a vector psi in some ray R. The symmetry representation theorem guarantees that u hat of t1 acting on psi is in the transformed ray r prime. Then u hat of t2 acting on the resulting vector, that must be in the transformed ray r double prime. We can actually be less stringent in our requirements for the operators. In fact, u hat of t1 2 need only be in the same ray r double prime. This means that the operators representing the transformation could represent the group up to a phase. So u hat of t2 after u hat of t1 as an operator could be equal to e to the i phi times u hat of t1 2. In this case, the Hilbert space is said to transform under a projective representation of the group G. If all the phases are zero, then it is said to transform under an ordinary representation. So how do we go about constructing a representation or a projective representation of a group? Last episode, we asked the question, once exponentiated, when will a representation of the Lie algebra of SU2 give us a representation of SU2, and when will it just give us a representation of SO3? In order to construct a representation, we will need both a representation of the Lie algebra and a set of paths in parameter space, i.e. the set of all parameters phi to A from the last episode. But what is a representation of the Lie algebra? Firstly, in an abstract sense, an algebra is just any vector space with a bilinear map, which takes in two vectors and gives you another vector. By bilinear, we mean that it is linear in both entries. The thought bubble shows you what we mean by linear in the left entry. In order for the algebra to be a Lie algebra, the bilinear map, which in this case is called the Lie bracket, must also satisfy, firstly, anti-symmetry, that v1 comma v2 equals minus v2 comma v1, and secondly, the Bianchi identity, that the sum over cyclic permutations of any three vectors in the Lie bracket gives you zero. The definition of a representation will mirror that of the definition of a Lie group representation. For us, a representation is a mapping from the Lie algebra into operators acting on a Hilbert space, and that map must preserve the structure inherent to the Lie algebra. We define the representation of the Lie bracket to be the commutator of the two operators. With this definition, the Bianchi identity is automatic, and then the representation must preserve this structure of the, ab of the abstract Lie bracket in an obvious way. The generators of the group XA from the last episode, they form a basis of the vector space L, and the structure constants tell us the commutator of them in this basis. We mentioned that we need a set of paths in parameter space to define a representation, but what is a path in parameter space? A path is a continuous function sigma from the open interval between 0 and 1 into the group. Sigma of 0 will be the starting point of the path, and sigma of 1 will be the end point. As the argument increases from 0 to 1, you move along the group from 0 to phi to a. Since sigma is continuous, a small change in the argument will lead to moving a small distance in the group parameter space. So suppose we have a representation of the Lie algebra. We then construct a representation of the group by defining a specific path, sigma theta, from the identity to theta a for each element of the group. We then use this path and the differential equation on screen to define an operator, u theta of s, at every point along the path. 
with boundary condition u theta of 0 as the identity operator. The operators representing each element of the group are the operators at the end of each path, u theta of 1. Suppose I have two parameters, theta 1 and theta 2. We said that we can use these paths to construct a representation of the group, but how do we do this? Consider the path that takes us from the identity to the combined element f of theta 1, theta 2. Sigma p of s is given by sigma theta 1 of 2s when s is between 0 and 1/2. This is equivalent to going along the standard path to theta 1 at double speed. Then for s between 1/2 and 1, we go along the combination of theta 1 and the standard path to theta 2, but with the argument being 2s minus 1. So if s equals 1/2, then this is just going to be f of theta 1 and 0, which is theta 1. And if s equals 1, then this is just the combined element f of theta 1, theta 2. So this combined path goes from 0 through to theta 1, and then from theta 1 through to the combined element f of theta 1 and theta 2. With some change of variables in the ODE, you can show that the operator at the end of this path is the product of the two individual operators, u of theta 2, u of theta 1. But how does this operator compare with the operator representing the combined element? We can show that under a small change of path, sigma goes to sigma plus delta sigma. If the endpoints are fixed, the operator at the end of the path remains unchanged. So if sigma p can be continuously deformed into the standard path for the combined element, then we find that the phase is zero. How do we determine if two paths can be continuously deformed into each other? This requires a topological concept called homotopy. Given two paths, sigma1 and sigma2, a homotopy is a continuous deformation of sigma1 into sigma2. A homotopy from sigma1 to sigma2, where both of the paths have the same start and end point, is a continuous function, h, that takes in two open intervals between 0 and 1 and maps you into the group. As you move s from 0 to 1, you go from 0 to phi to 1 as before. But this time, as the other entry t goes from 0 to 1, you continuously change path. So h of 0 and s is just the original path sigma 1 of s, but h of 1 and s is the new path sigma 2. For any other value of t, you get h of t and s is a path somewhere between these two. If a path has the same start and end point, it's called a loop. We can collect the set of all loops at the identity into a set which we call L of G. Given two loops, we can define the product loop, which is similar to the combined path from the last side. Sigma 1 star sigma 2 is sigma 1 of 2s along the first half of the path, and then sigma 2 of 2s minus 1 along the second half. We can define an equivalence relation on the set of all loops at the identity by saying that two loops are in the same equivalence class if there exists a homotopy between them. We then call the identification space pi1 of g, or the fundamental group. We can make pi1 of g into a group, with the law of composition being that the equivalence class of sigma1 combined with the equivalence class of sigma2 is the equivalence class of the combined loop. An intuitive example is to consider the 2D Euclidean plane with a hole in it. A loop sigma 0 that stays around the vicinity of the identity is contractible to a point. However, consider a loop sigma 1 which wraps around the hole anticlockwise. This loop can't be continuously deformed into sigma 0. Any loop that wraps around the hole twice can't be deformed into sigma 0 either, but it also can't be deformed into sigma 1. The loops are classified by how many times they wrap around the hole, and whether it wraps around the hole clockwise or anticlockwise. The fundamental group is isomorphic to the set of all integers, with the composition law being addition. So we can assign to each loop a winding number n, with n being the number of times that it wraps around the hole anticlockwise, a negative integer meaning that it wraps around the hole clockwise. Clearly if I run through a path with a winding number of 1 twice, the combined path will have a winding number of 2. However, if the fundamental group is the trivial group, i.e. the group with one element, then G is said to be simply connected. Since any two paths from 0 to phi to 1 can form a loop by going along one of the paths backwards, if G is simply connected, 
then any two paths with the same start and end point can be continuously deformed into each other. So if G is simply connected, then we can use the results from the previous slides to see that there are no projective representations of the group. And this tells us that for a simply connected group, every representation of the Lie algebra will give us an ordinary representation of the group by exponentiation. If the group is not simply connected, but we know what the fundamental group is, we can usually use that knowledge to learn about the nature of the projective representations, which is what we'll do with rotations. So now we'll return to looking at the group of rotations, SO3. What does the parameter space look like? We said before that a rotation is parameterized by a, an angle from 0 to 2 pi, and b, a unit vector. We can think of a unit vector as an element on the unit sphere S2. However, it should be clear from a quick drawing that rotating by an angle theta about the axis n is actually the same rotation as rotating by 2 pi minus theta about the axis minus n. We don't want to double parameterize because otherwise we wouldn't properly be analyzing the topology of the parameter space. So we have to restrict the angle from zero to pi. This would make the parameter space equivalent to a solid sphere of radius pi. However, if I rotate by pi about n, that's still the same rotation as rotating by pi about minus n. <clears throat> so you'd have to think of these two points on the sphere as somehow being the same point. Now, how do we do that? Before analyzing the rotation parameter space, we'll look at a slightly simpler example that will illustrate this idea. Consider a rectangle. If you've ever played certain video games like Snake, you'll remember that as the snake moves to the edge of the rectangle, say at the point A, it suddenly emerges on the other side, A prime. You could think of this as a rectangle with opposite points connected, or you could say that this space would be equivalent to taking one side of the rect rectangle and wrapping it around and gluing it to the other side. If you did that, you'd get this curved surface, which is kind of like the surface of a cylinder. So we wish to do this for rotations. The parameter space of rotations is a sphere of radius pi, but antipodal points are identified. I, people often say that Australia is on the opposite side of the world from the UK. I don't actually know if that's true, but if it were, then you would say that Australia would be the antipodal point to the UK. So in this case, if you look at the diagram, we'd say that A is the same point as A prime and B is the same point as B prime. So you could say, okay, we'll take the sphere here and we'll just, we'll wrap it around and we'll glue A to A prime and we'll glue B to B prime and we'll see what it looks like. Uh, the problem here is you can't really draw or visualize this space without having more than three spatial dimensions. So instead, we're just gonna have to remember that the antipodal points are the same point when we're analyzing this. Uh, this strange topology is actually what is responsible for the existence of half integer spin, as we'll see over the next few slides. What is the fundamental group of SO3? We call the constant loop of the identity C0, and this will act as the identity element of the group. Now any loop such as sigma1, which stays entirely within the interior of the sphere, will be in this equivalence class. However, if we consider a loop which passes through the surface once at the point A, this is a continuous loop because remember that A and A prime are actually the same point. However, if I try to slightly change this path, if I move the path at A slightly to the left or right, it also must move at A prime such that the points always stay opposite in order for the loop to remain continuous. So there is no way for me to continuously deform this into sigma one. But what if a loop passes through the surface twice? It is true that A must always stay opposite to A prime and B must always stay opposite to B prime. But there is nothing to stop me from continuously deforming the path such that A gets closer and closer to B prime. Eventually, I can bring them to the same point and continuously collapse the loop back into sigma one. So we can repeat this for any number of passes through the surface. And we find that any loop which passes through the surface an even number of times will be deformable into sigma one. And any loop which passes through the surface an odd number of times will be deformable into sigma two. <laughs>
So the fundamental group of SO3 has two elements. And we can see that it's actually isomorphic to Z2. Because if I have a loop that runs through the surface once, and I combine it with another loop that runs through the surface once, I'll get a loop that runs through the surface twice. But that is equivalent to the identity element. So we've found that SO3 is not simply connected. And this means that there could be projective representations of the group. And we'll spend the rest of the lecture by looking at the nature of those representations and the relationship with the group SU2. Since SO3 is not simply connected, it has projective representations. So the product of two operators, u of phi to 2, u of phi to 1, could be some phase e to the i phi times the combined operator. If this phase is non-zero, then the path sigma p used to define the left-hand side must be in a different equivalence class to the path used to define the right-hand side. We can exploit our knowledge of the fundamental group of SO3 and the fact that it's had two to see that running through any loop twice will always be deformable to the identity. So the phase will either be plus one or minus one. What about projective representations of SU2? It turns out SU2 is simply connected. There is a theorem that relates these two groups, which states that if G is a connected Lie group with Lie algebra lowercase g and fundamental group pi one of G, then there will always be some simply connected group called the universal cover, which has the same Lie algebra. And there will also be a quotient group isomorphism, just like the one that we have found. So we can see that SU2 is the universal cover of SO3. So what does this relationship of universal cover mean? And why is it interesting to us? Up to this point, we have found that SO3 having Z2 as its fundamental group means that there are two possible phases in a projective representation. We also found that since SO3 is the quotient group of SU2 with Z2, there are two elements of SU2 for every one element of SO3. This brings us to Bergman's theorem, that projective representations of G have lifts as ordinary representations of the universal cover. And what do we mean by a lift? Now, the fact that u of phi to 2, u of phi to 1 is equal to plus or minus u of f of phi to 1, phi to 2, this means that in a projective representation of SO3, there are effectively two operators for each element of SO3. We can just use the two elements of SU2 that correspond to each element of SO3 as these operators. In fact, we can completely forget about SO3, because even ordinary representations of SO3, they're still representations of SU2. Because remember, we said there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the Lie algebra and the Lie group if the group is simply connected. It's just that some representations of the SU2 Lie algebra, when you exponentiate them, they'll give you SO3. And they're just unfaithful representations of SU2. So rotational invariance implies that the Hilbert space transforms under a representation of SU2, not a representation of SO3, the group of rotations. Given this, it might be useful to figure out what the irreducible representations of SU2 are. This derivation should be familiar from any quantum mechanics course, so we'll go through it quite quickly. Since SU2 is simply connected, we only need to find representations of the Lie algebra. We can define the j squared operator as j squared equals j1 squared plus j2 squared plus j3 squared and find that this commutes with any of the free generators. We can also define j plus minus as j1 plus or minus ij2. Since j squared commutes with any of the generators, we can simultaneously diagonalize it with a choice of one generator. So we choose to express the Hilbert space in the simultaneous eigenbasis of j squared and j3. The operators j plus minus are called the lowering slash raising operators because they lower slash raise the eigenvalues of j3 by one. From one of the axioms of the inner product, that the modulus of a vector is always greater than or equal to zero, we can find that the eigenvalue j must be an integer or a half integer. 
We also find that mj runs from minus j to j in integer steps. So an irreducible representation of SU2 is labeled by an integer or half integer j, which we identify with the total spin. It turns out that when j is an integer, exponenting the generators, sorry, exponentiating the generators gives you a representation of SO3, which is also an unfaithful representation of SU2. If j is a half integer, then it gives a projective representation of SO3, which is also a faithful representation of SU2. So when people say, for a half integer spin particle, you have to rotate by four pi to get back to where you started, you know that this is kind of false. If you rotate by two pi, you have multiplied your vector by minus one because you're transforming under a projective representation. But minus one times a vector represents the same physical state as the original vector. So it turns out that a system having rotational invariance is more than enough to explain the existence of half integer spin particles. They just transform under a projective representation of the rotation group. As we said at the start, uh, the reason we have studied rotations is because rotations are actually a subgroup of the symmetry group of special relativity. So in next lecture, we're gonna look at special relativity and we're gonna study the symmetry group and we'll find that most of the complications in understanding that group will be the same as the complications that we had in understanding rotations.